all ask questions. Why is the sky blue? What happened to all the dinosaurs? What was the best thing before sliced bread? But some questions are more important than others. How do I forgive someone even when I feel like I can't? What's my purpose in life? How can I be the parent God wants me to be and the one my kids need me to be? So where do we turn? To the one that has all the answers. We'll tackle some of life's most complex issues and discover God's best plan. Why? Because you asked for it. Good morning. It is well with my soul. The worship team just did a great job. Can you just thank them for leading us into God's presence this morning? That was awesome. If you're here for the first time or you're new to City Church, we just want to say welcome home. If you're watching online, we welcome you to City Church today. We have a goal here at City Church, and that is to bring God's love to this city one person at a time and to see every person become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And if you are here new today, your first step in that journey is to go to Growth Track. The first Sunday of every month, Growth Track starts, and it's just kind of the entry point to learn about us, but also help you discover who God has designed you to be. And then there you will learn to find your place to serve. Let me tell you today, if you're not serving in the body of Christ, if you're not serving in a local church, you're missing a huge part of the design that God has for you and discovering your significance on planet Earth. And then to get into a small group. We want every person here to get connected relationally where you can develop relationships with other Christians. You can grow in your knowledge of the Bible and pray together and then just hang out and have a good time as Christ followers. Well, we're really honored that you are with us today. And uh, this last Easter, uh, we've mentioned this before, but this last Easter, we asked a bunch of, uh, a lot of people that were here, we asked you to, what are the, like, the most important things that you'd like to hear us talk about? And we've saved the best for last. Today, we say the best for last. So we're in the series, You Asked For It. And the number one topic that people asked us to speak on, anybody know what it is? Marriage. The number one topic is marriage. And so I'm going to speak to you today, and I've actually brought my better half, 29 years of marital <laughs> joy. She's the love of my life, my best friend. I brought her. She's going to help us this morning as we talk about how to have a successful marriage. And I got to tell you, I got to tell you, it hasn't all been marital bliss. Uh, there is some big, there's some there's I told Pastor Glenn earlier this week we were playing golf and I shot a I, I shot a terrible shot we had to go look for it and we were driving the golf cart over there and I, I said you know I said the, the the reason the reason that we are still together is because of her and she's put up with this nonsense for a long time and I'm grateful for her love in my life. Hey, uh, I threw up on uh, social media this week. I asked a few of my Facebook friends, like, what, what are some things that, you know, other people, not you, but other people that you know would, might need some help in, in marriage? And I got a lot of responses. I mean, a lot of people asked. And I got to tell you, there were a couple of things that were really dominant. Uh, and if you're not on Facebook, I want to say, how many people are not on Facebook yet? How many people don't? Okay. There's about four of you in the room. All right. For, for the rest of you, if you're not my friend, I'd love to be your friend on Facebook, and you can kind of follow what's going on in our life. And I do some church stuff, but just some life stuff and some quotes from the Bible and things that God's speaking to me. But I'd encourage you, man, just go ahead on social media. You can look up my name, and or you can look up my wife's name. And But uh, I forgot where I was going with that. But I asked some questions, yeah. And the number one topic, the number one thing that people asked about was communication communicate how to communicate with our spouse and then the second one was money and the third one was kids fourth one was priorities you know what the last one was i only had like one person ask about sex that was it so it, it's it's fascinating it's fascinating how that in our culture that's the biggest issue but when it really comes down to having a marriage and, and how to succeed the fact is in order to have great sex you got to have great communication and so we're going to talk about some things this morning we're going to talk about that's good we can say that word in church right it's way better in here than out there because out there it's dirty and polluted and corrupted, distorted and wrong. And, but God's got a great design for us today. And we're going to learn this one. We're going to lay the foundation for marriage. We're going to start right in the very beginning. If you, have, if you have your Bible, if you turn to the first couple of pages of the Bible, as a matter of fact, right in the very beginning, God laid out the plan for the family. Here's the deal, guys. God said it. God laid out the institution of marriage as the foundation of all society and culture. 
And I'm going to read to you what God said. So every, every significant doctrine in your life that God has called us to live by and to walk out is found in the book of Genesis. And right in the very beginning, we're going to see God's plan for marriage. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. As we do here at City Church, we stand in, the, in, in honor of reading the uh, Word of God. So I want you to stand with me as we read Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse number 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18. And the Bible says, the Lord God said, not President Obama, not the Supreme Court, not your, your political science teacher at school. The Lord God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. And so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs, and he closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman. <laughs> all the men said, whoa, man, check this out. From the rib he had taken him out of man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And this is why a man leaves his father and mother, and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. I want to talk to you this morning on how to have a successful marriage. Not a perfect marriage but a successful marriage. I want to pray over you this morning. Would you close your eyes? Father, uh, grace is so amazing. Your presence is so amazing. We love what you've already done in our midst today. But God, over these next few moments, we're asking for your spirit to challenge us, to convict us, to draw us closer to an understanding of your design and purpose for our families. Lord, for every married couple that's here today, Father, for those who are with their spouse or not with their spouse, for those who are married today, I pray, God, that their hearts will be open to hear what you have to say. God, for those who are single in the room, God, I, I pray, Lord, that their ears be open, open attentively because, God, we know that you have designed and created us for companionship and relationship. And so I pray today, God, I pray over every person in this room that they'll have a, an ear to hear. And I pray for myself to have a mouth to speak. God, I pray that your grace would be with us in your wonderful name. Amen. You may be seated. Marriage. Marriage is a divine union between a man and a woman designed by God to enable both partners to fully live out their purpose. That's the plan of marriage. God designed marriage between a man and a woman to enable both partners to fully live out their divine purpose for being. I've asked my wife to come, and uh, we're going to talk about it. You should have got a little handout this morning, every person. Hopefully you got the, I thought I had a handout up here, but you should have got a handout. If you did not get a handout, the ushers are here to give you a handout. Everyone here got a handout. It should look something like this if you need one of these. Uh, we're going to just go through some really practical steps, some pillars to building a successful marriage. But uh, we're going to talk about the first point. The first way that we build a successful marriage is by understanding our purpose in life. By understanding our purpose in life. And so uh, I'm going to sit down here and I'm going to have Miss Laura. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about having purpose and walking out purpose in our marriage and life. And Laura and I have been married 29 years. And there are some things that we have learned as we've taken this journey together. And the first thing really has to do with purpose and cause. And so... Uh, this is my wife's passion. She loves talking about this, and she's going to help us with this. So, Lord, do you believe that every person here has been designed, every couple here has been designed by God with a purpose? Absolutely. And uh, actually, that's one of the main reasons that God brings us together in marriage. And um, to just springboard off of the passage that we just read, Genesis 2.18 uh, says, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a help. A helper suitable for him and that's the companionship part of marriage one of the three reasons so the three reasons are companionship procreation and dominion and uh, that passage that says a helper suitable a suitable help helper actually in the Hebrew 
is the word Ezer. Everybody say Ezer. And Ezer means a lifesaver counterpart literally cannot flourish without the support complement. It's what makes them one flesh. It's, bring, it's what brings them together in mission so that they're in a complementary way yoked together for whatever God has called them to do. And the second reason is procreation. And uh, that's when God said in Genesis 1.28, be fruitful and multiply and uh, fill the earth, govern, have dominion over the earth. And uh, that's the bringing up children part. That's the raising offspring part. It's such an important part of marriage. In Malachi, it says, I hate divorce because I am wanting a godly offspring. Mm -hmm. The very important third reason is dominion and stewardship. And that comes out of that verse as well. To be stewards over the earth, to have dominion over the earth. And, um, you know, Eugene and I knew when we were married, um, at the end of our ceremony, there was a, a prophetic word that we were not to do anything in life but ministry. And so we're called to the, we're called to the local church. But there are many of you that are, are not necessarily called to work full-time. Most of you are not called to work full-time in the ministry. But they're, they're called to work full-time, just yeah, not serving not, in pastoral ministry. Exactly, yeah. yes. Um, and there, there are Everyone seven, likes money here, so they got to yeah. work. That's right, yeah. There are seven cultural mountains that uh, you as couples are called to be part of. And uh, the first one is family, to strengthen the family. The second area you may be called is to government. The third one, arts and entertainment. Uh, the fourth one, the media. Fifth one is business and science. Uh, the sixth one would be education, and the seventh one would be the church. But God brings couples so often together mm -hmm. to fulfill what has been um, laid in their heart from even the time they were children. And it doesn't necessarily mean that both of you will be nurses or both of you will be in the same exact thing, but they will be complementary and your calls will come together. Uh, at the end of this service, uh, a gal that's just been married, my friend Brittany's just been married a couple months, and she said, you were talking about core values and calling, and I just discovered my husband and I we're both really hard workers. We had that core value, and we're starting a business together. Well, that's a great example of somebody that has a calling, and it comes out in the way they're wired. Uh, but what God has called us to in marriage is what I call to be a missional marriage. It isn't just marriage for marriage's sake. The, what you hear in the secular media is pretty much just about the love part of it, right? You don't hear about the commitment. You don't hear about the calling. But that really is the undergirding, the foundation of marriage and what makes it successful. So missional marriages are brought together to further his kingdom and to be change agents in the earth. And you can be change agents to any one of those seven areas that I, I talked to, or the Lord may have something even uniquer than that for you to do and to make change in society through what God has called you to do together as a couple. Uh, First Peter 3, 7 says that we are heirs together. He's talking to husbands. You're heirs together of the grace of God. And when it says heirs together, there is a special, special grace that is brought on a couple when they come together with united purpose, with united call, and committed in marriage. It's something that you can do together as a couple that you could never do by yourself. Um, and then the other, the other thing that I think about often is the word submission. And if you take that word apart, submission, it has two parts. There's the mission part of marriage, and uh, often the husband will lead the charge in that mission part. But he needs a subcontractor underneath him. That's really good. To a submission, the vice president to his president, the one that will be the executor of, of his vision, where they will work together and they will be linked together. That doesn't mean that the yeah. man... <laughs> That doesn't mean so that the man will all, always be the most outgoing or the most forceful of the two. We see a lot of examples, like Margaret Thatcher and her husband, Dennis. He was the one that was always saying, steady girl, you keep going. He was the supporter. He, he helped to nourish the children, in fact. Or um, Joyce and Paul Meyer, there are different examples of what that balance will look like. But it is a complementary union where you're supporting one another's vision. And uh, without the sub to the mission, it's mission impossible, I like to say. Mm. Excellent. Talk about uh, us. How did, you, how did you know that God brought us together? How did you know that God brought us together for our purpose? You know, I was 27 before I met Eugene, and um, it was my fourth year of Bible college. I'd done the other three years earlier in my um, school career. 
when I taught high school and um, in our field at Bible Temple, the church that I grew up in, the first year of Bible college, um, this is kind of a joke that went around, the first year of Bible college, you would pray, Lord, send the man, send the man. <laughs> the second, third year, you would say, Lord, send a man, send a man. And then by the fourth year of Bible college, you'd say, Lord, send any man, any man. <laughs> well, I, I was, was the any man. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, he was <laughs> But when I was 27, <clears throat> so by the time you were 25, the prayer teams would be working. The prayer chains would be called if you weren't married, at least in those circles. <laughs> but I was, um, when I was 27, I was still picky. I was, I would say I was as picky as Jerry Seinfeld. And um, partly it was because I had some very strong core values and, and I uh, had dated previously and I would always run into one of those core values that wasn't in the person that I was interested in. And uh, it seemed like I was fickle, but more than anything, I would come up against that bumper of something. For example, one guy I was interested in, I was at his house and there was beer in the refrigerator and that's just one of my core values. There was another guy who was flaky in his church attendance. There was another guy who was, uh, didn't tithe. Those were huge things to me. So when I ran into, uh, the first thing that, that happened when I met, ran into Eugene, I started noticing that our values were the same. And um, it was kind of like, uh, I saw one after another going right down my list of values that I had. The first one was uh, I brought, came home from work one day and I was a waitress and I had uh, chocolate eclairs and Napoleons. And I, I was put it in a nice box and I was going to give it to another guy who I didn't see. And so Eugene was there. That was when my I lucky day. <laughs> it all started with chocolate eclairs. That's a pretty nice story. So I gave, I like you, I gave Eugene the eclair and then the next day he wrote me a thank you card. So it really all started with a thank you card. I had never had a thank you card for all the Guys, you take pastries. notes out there, single guys? <laughs> and get a clue? No. <laughs> and then the next morning I noticed that he was at early morning prayer. In fact, I, I noticed that he was at early morning prayer every day at 6.30, he was at prayer. And then I started to notice that on Friday nights, instead of running around with um, the other guys, he was out on the street corner witnessing. And uh, then the, the last thing that I said, what is going on here? There, uh, there was a, a guy from Taiwan that was Japan. in Japan that was in his dorm and um, he was blind. And every night Eugene would read the Bible to him because he couldn't read it for himself. And I heard about that and I thought, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but this could not be the one because he loves Clint Eastwood movies. <laughs> and I wore I, cowboy boots. <laughs> he wore cowboy boots. He couldn't sing. I thought I, whoever I married, we would write songs together. If they built this church, <laughs> if you let me sing, you're all running out the door. You know, it ain't gonna happen. But there were some things. So um, the first thing, but so I, I just want to give you three ways to know that this is Mr. Right or Miss Right. And the first one is core values. So write that down. It starts with a C. The second one is confirmation of those that know you well. Mm -hmm. And that happened with us. Before I even met uh, Eugene, I had two of my best friends, one guy, one girl, that came up to me and said, we can stop praying. We found the one for you. He walks like you. He's called like you. He's intense like you. I, and I, I kept hearing this from two or three people. They said, Eugene Smith, Eugene Smith. I said, that, it doesn't even sound like somebody I'd be interested in. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I finally met him, and, uh, but I went to my sister and it was rough, guys. It was rough. <laughs> my sister had been already married three, even though she's 18 months younger than me, she'd been married three years, so she was kind of an expert. And I said, I have this guy. We talk all the time. We're so similar. We have the same values. Everything we talk about, we can just talk on forever. But I don't like him because he likes Clint Eastwood movies. He, you know, <laughs> she said, Laura, Go you ahead, got it all wrong. <laughs> this is the guy for you. This is the guy for you. And I, I don't know. So I went to my counselor and she said, Laura, I feel God is up to something here and I don't want you to miss the boat. And so I, I had five different people that gave me strong words of confirmation. And I had never had anybody confirm anybody that I had dated up to that point. No one had been, no, nah, this is not the right guy. So it, it uh, lined up core values confirmation. The last one was we really started talking. We really started to get to know each other. And we had the same common 
complementary dreams and visions for the future. In fact, they were they were pretty much identical, mm. and uh, so that really was three. And these these three keep single people keep these in your Bible. These are really really good. I didn't even come up with these till a couple of days ago, except that they lived out in my life. But that um, that confirmation of those that know you well that's huge. You know, people around you, especially when you get to be you know get up there in age, they're not. Killjoys. They're not wanting you to get together. She's still the older woman in my <laughs> life. <laughs> uh, they, the people w around you want want you to be with somebody, but they just want to make sure that you're choosing the right one. What about couples here today? You're not on the same page purpose. As a matter of fact, maybe you weren't a Christ follower and you got married, and, and now you are, and they're going a different direction, or maybe you are a Christ follower, and, and your marriages are just kind of going different directions. What kind of counsel would you give them today? Sometimes um, couples, even uh, goodwill couples, are uh, together, but they're at odds. You're out of sync, I like to say. Um, you know, Satan does not want you to fulfill the mission right. and the call that he has for the two of you. And he will fight it in any way that he can. He fights it through uh, planning thoughts in your head. He fights it through something called, he wants to sabotage the mission, in other words, mm -hmm. that God has for your life. Um, often he uh, attacks the mission in your life by just making little insignificant things in your marriage a huge thing. And uh, it's called the crazy cycle. We're learning that in our small group, Love and Respect. And the, the crazy cycle is based on a scripture from Ephesians 5, 31 and 33. And that's uh, the verse that's on your handout. Um, it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and the two will become one flesh. And then it says, husbands, love your wives and respect your husbands. And uh, the crazy cycle says that without love, she reacts without respect. With, without love, she reacts without respect. And without respect, he reacts without love. In other words, there is a driving need in each woman to feel loved. And when she has that need met, she is happy. And there's a driving need in man to feel respect. And when he feels respected, he is happy. And he also responds in love. So but the, the wonderful thing about it is the healing formula is that either one of them can stop that cycle at any time. The woman can stop that cycle by unconditional respect. And the man can stop that cycle by unconditional love. Mm. And even if, even if the, the Bible says that for unbelieving husbands, if the woman respects her husband, that is a huge evangelistic um, technique to win the win your man over to the Lord. He sees that respect, mm -hmm. and it does something in his heart. It softens his heart, and it opens his heart to to Jesus and to the gospel. And um, but you know, I didn't I didn't know this. I didn't. I grew up in the 70s learning about submission, and that was really all we learned about in marriage. And everything was about the wife submitting. And it wasn't until even the last 10 years that I ran into that book, Love and Respect. And I also uh, ran into a book that just has been a game changer in the way that I look at marriage and the way I relate to my husband. And that's Proper Care and Feeding of Husbands. And I like that book a lot. It's my favorite book. <laughs> <laughs> I like to give that book to engaged um, women. Um, almost every time I, I think of it, I give them that book. But... Um, we were listening to a podcast yesterday, and Lou Holtz, the coach, was on there. And, and one thing he said that, that I, I wrote down, he said, really you will be the same person you are today in five years, except for the books you read, the people you meet, and the dreams that you dream. Mm. And uh, we, don't, we don't automatically know some of these things. So, so many, even the love and respect thing is counterintuitive to, to the way we want to react to our spouses, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You feel like being disrespectful. You pe feel like being snarky. I default to snarky a lot, and God forgives me, and we keep moving forward. She's the smartest <laughs> one in the family, absolutely. But um, we, we all fall short in this area, but when you realize it as a couple, if you get back on the pattern of respect mm -hmm. and love, it changes everything in your marriage. Mm, that's excellent, excellent. Laura has, uh, really, really struggled today. If you don't know, three years ago, she had a massive tumor found in her throat and uh, the doctors removing the tumor, they nicked her vocal cord. And so she has a very difficult time talking. And I just want to, you to, I want you to know that I love you. And I'm so proud of you for doing this because this was very tough to do.
You know, purpose, we're created for purpose. We're designed by God for purpose. But I can tell you some things that will destroy, will destroy your purpose, will destroy your marriage. I call them home wreckers or how to have a sucky marriage. I just want to just want to kind of right up front here. So we got a purpose. We're designed by God. But there are things that will rob that. Lord had mentioned that Satan wants to destroy. He wants to kill your life. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly. And so I just want to give you some points. They're right there in your handout. But the first thing is arguing as a normative way of living. Arguing as a normative way of living. And that's... Uh, you know, maybe you're in a household right now, man, and you're at each other's throat all the time. And I got to, this will destroy, this This constant arguing and going back and forth at one another is just a, it's a home wrecker. It'll destroy your relationship. The second one is uh, avoidance. Avoiding the really difficult things in life. Avoiding talking about your kids. Avoiding talking about money issues. A lot of spouses, man, I mean, a lot of people, they train wreck over this area of, of money. And they're not talking about it. They're not being open about it. Pastor Glenn, a couple weeks ago, talked about money. And, you know, one, one part of the, the couple is a bean counter. And the other part's a party animal. And when these kinds of things happen in a relationship and you're not really clear about it, it can create a lot of challenges in your life. The, the next one is wrong priorities. Having wrong priorities. Putting your job or your profession above your relationship. It's a home wrecker. Uh, this one has having to do with kids, getting on the same page, having the same core values, having the same priorities about what you want to see take place in your kids. One of the most powerful things that happened to us was in a small group. Our son had just been born, our oldest son, so it was about, uh, he's 26 now, so about 26 years ago, we came across some material called Growing Kids God's Way. And my wife and I really learned that we had similar values in this area, but we developed some really clear guidelines some things that we were going to do as parents to help raise our kids. And so having a priority, and, and this is really tough with blended families. If you're here today and you're a blended home and you've come together and you've got kids and her kids and his kids, and it's challenging because you've got natural tendency. That's my kid. Don't say that to them. And so you got to get on the same page, the priority of how are you going to raise your kids. And uh, a lot of people put their hobbies and all kinds of things before the relationship. The other one is negativity. This goes being arguing. This is just being negative about your spouse. Uh, for a wife, when she disrespects her husband publicly, that's so negative. It's such a ne I, I, I've actually heard this recently. I heard a spouse just tearing her husband down in front of other people, being negative. And God has not called us to be negative about our spouse. God has called us to believe in our spouse to champion them, to, be, to believe the best, to speak the best about them. The other one is addictions. 15% of all marriages end because of addictions. 15%. I don't know, it's alcohol, it's drugs, it's porn, whatever the relationship, get help. We have a ministry called Celebrate Recovery, but there are, there are programs. Go to counseling. Do what you have to do to get fixed. Someone said amen. The last one is affairs. Uh, affairs is the ultimate game, is the ultimate home wrecker absolutely and i want to if you're sexting if you're texting if you're talking inappropriately to someone at work or you're up on facebook looking up an old girlfriend or boyfriend i'm just gonna tell you stop it it is it's the beginning of you going down the wrong trail and seeing your marriage coming to death and god has not called us to people be people of death god's called us to be people of life and so your purpose, your design by God is to serve the Lord together and fulfill the mission for which he has created you. And so we're called for the cause and the purpose. The second thing is God's developed us and designed us for companionship. God's designed us for companionship. Genesis chapter 2, the verse that Laura quoted earlier, the Bible says that God created a help me, a helper for them. He said, he said it's not good for you to be alone. It's not good. There's, there's a natural desire in every person here to have community, to have companionship, to have relationship. We are relational beings. Health and companionship is built by focusing on becoming your spouse's best friend. Focusing on becoming your spouse's best friend. And here's a couple ways that you can do that. First of all, you got to cheer your spouse on. you got to be your spouse's biggest fan. We had been married just for a couple of years, and we had moved from Portland. We were in Seattle, and, and my wife had gone from being in the, the restaurant business into moving into the sales business. She found herself in a sales company, and they were selling advertising. And, and I remember she would come home and tell me about all these goals and all these different kinds of things that she could do to make more money. 
And I'm like, go for it, girl. Yeah, go for it. But she started, she's really driven by competition and by winning and success. And, and she would come home and she would accomplish a goal. And I remember one time I put a great big banner over our door. And it was a little title they gave for a person if they accomplished a certain goal. And I put that banner over there and, and I was cheering her on. I want to encourage you today. Cheer your spouse on. Become their biggest fan. The second thing is develop common interests. Uh, there's a passage in Deuteronomy that talks about when a couple gets married in their very first year of relationship, that basically the guy is not to do any work. And all the guys said, hey, man, <laughs> he's not to go to war. They're just to have fun and get to know one another. Develop common interests. It's taken 29 years for us to really understand each other and walk this out. And, but there are things that we love to do. We love to talk about politics. We love to talk about the future. We love to talk about our kids. We, we like going up to Ormond Beach and taking these long walks. We have a certain spot. We start at a certain spot, and, and we finish at a sp certain spot. And we know exactly how long, long that is. And we have these little pedometers. She has a little pedometer. She wears a Fitbit. I keep my phone on me. And we count our steps every day. A lot of times we'll have competition. We'll have competition because she, she's, she's really competitive and she likes to win. <laughs> likes to, I can tell you that. Develop common interests. Do your chores together. God bless them. Look at Genesis 1, 28. God bless them. Be fruitful. Increase in number. And all the men say, amen. Fill the earth and subdue. Rule over the fish of the sea. Rule over the fish of the sea. Do life together. We make the bed together a lot of times. We, I've learned my wife's love language is acts of service. You know, there's quality time and gifts and acts of service and physical touch. And my wife's love language is acts of service. Uh, if I'm going to feel that love bond growing our relationship, I've got to serve not only her, but we serve alongside of each other. My natural tendency when I come home, I, I don't want to start cleaning the dishes. I don't want to wipe the counters down. But I've learned that as we do stuff together, life is better. And we develop that companionship and that relationship. And the last one is create moments of intimacy. Create moments of intimacy together. Intimacy starts way, bef way before you ever end up in the bed together. Intimacy starts in just your daily walk and your conversation and the way that you love one another, the way you talk to one another. You expect to be intimate, sir, at the end of the day after you've been mean and nasty and critical and harsh and judgmental. It's going to be an icy day in that bed that night. Develop intimacy is start, starts way before, way before the physical act of having a sexual relationship. I came across this picture. It was two redwood trees that had grown together. These two redwood trees are over 2,000 years old. They're found in Northern California. And uh, these redwoods, somewhere the, the tree guys tell us about, five, about the age of 500, they came together. At the age of 500, and for over 1,500 years, they've been stuck everyone say stuck they've been stuck together in relationship they've grown together and that's exactly what god has called us to do god has called us to grow together in our relationship the third one is commitment everyone say commitment successful marriages make a life long commitment Matthew chapter 7, verse number 24 says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. Everyone say wise man. Who built his house on the rock. You have a choice today. You have a choice today. The choices you make today will determine your destiny tomorrow. Where all the choices that you've made up to this place and this time of your life. The choices you make today will determine your destiny tomorrow. Jesus said, a wise man builds his house upon the rock. The rock that we are to build our house on is the foundation of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, a foolish man builds his house upon the sand. And when the storms come and the rains come and the fights come and the arguments come and, and the brokenness come and the hurt comes and the financial failure comes, if your house is built on the sand, it will not last. It will come crashing down. And Jesus challenges this foundation is built by commitment. Everyone say commitment. I prayed over a couple last night at a marriage, at a marriage ceremony in Palatka. How many of you have ever been to Palatka before? My first experience and last experience in Palatka last night. <laughs> like Palatka's easy to drive. Just keep on driving. But I prayed over this couple last night. It was one of my favorite things to do to go to weddings and to celebrate God's design for a man and a woman to come together to become one flesh. 
And as I was praying over this couple, they gave me the mic, and that's always a dangerous thing to do to give it. They just asked me to pray, but I had to say something, you know? And, and so this is what I said. I said, I used to talk about love a lot, and the preacher there said a lot of nice things about loving, and that was all wonderful. And love is, love is the foundation. Love is the foundation. I get it. God is love. But this word right here, commitment, that's the word. Because, see, commitment is lived out over a long period of time. Commitment is, is strengthened by the words that you speak and is proved by the actions of your life. And we want to build our lives on the right foundation. we got to be committed. I, I, I started a revolution about 12 years ago, and Laura and I did this thing on, on, over at the airport campus on, on family, and it's called hashtag wife for life. And I got to challenge you, if you don't know what hashtag wife, if you don't know what hashtag is, is, you can go to Google and you can put in the search bar, hashtag wife for life, and it'll pull up every time that I've posted a hashtag wife for life or anybody else has posted that phrase. And this commitment, this saying yes through the ups and the downs, we build our house on the solid rock. When we don't build our relationship on feelings, we build it on faith. See, feelings are so fickle. Uh, this Bible scholar, her name is Vanessa Hudgens, she told Cosmo Magazine, said, if you really love someone, you shouldn't have to work at it. And that's just a big lie. I mean, that's kind of the lie of our culture. Man, if I really love someone, it just should come natural. You know, if, it, if I have to work, there's something wrong. But the truth is exactly the opposite. If I'm going to have a life of a successful marriage, I'm going to have to make some really tough decisions. Not based on how I feel in the moment. Too many people, they base their, their, their relationship on feelings. That's exactly what happens when, when you have sexual intimacy, when you get involved sexually with the person before you're married. You've based that relationship on that physical attraction, which is very important. I was super attracted. I remember the day that when the sky rockets went off. I remember that day when we locked eyes. And baby, it was all over. But those feelings haven't carried me for 29 years of marriage. Haven't carried her for 29 years of marriage. We, we say yes, no matter how we feel. We're committed to be people of faith. There's three levels that we walk through in this relationship. There's the, the level I want to. I want to love this person. I want to be married to this person. It happens at the altar. Last night I saw this couple. They read their vows. They, they were in love with one another. I mean, there were stars in their eyes. I want to. And then you move to that place of, I ought to. Every relationship at some point will have the ought to. I, I ought to do it. It's biblical. It's moral. It's the right thing. And there's the, I have to. I got to do it. Uh, financially, I have to do it. I got to do it for the sake of the kids. And your relationship, you might walk through all stages of this, of this understanding of commitment. But at the end of the day, your commitment is based on the yes. Your yes is bigger. Your yes to commitment to God, to your spouse, and to your family is bigger than your, feeling, uh, your feelings in that moment. 29 years of marriage, I've learned a few things. I've learned today that we have to be agreement. We have to live in agreement. How can two walk together unless they're agreed? You've got to be in agreement on money. You've got to be in agreement on your kids. You've got to be in agreement on your sexual relationship. You've got to be in agreement. These are big deals. I want to challenge the men here today. Lead the way. Be real men. Fight for your wife. Fight for your relationship. I mean, so many times, it's the women that are reading the books and studying, and they're the women talking about it. And guys, I'm challenging you today. You lead the way. Come on, you be the person. Uh, it's not about uh, your mate becoming a better them. It's about you becoming a better you. If you want your mate to become a better person, you become a better person. Someone said amen. Watch the words. Strike divorce. There's some of you who've already experienced it. And, well, you can walk, you could preach this better than me. You've seen these things happen in your relationship that led you to that place. But I want to challenge you. Watch your words. Your words have life. Your words have death. Your words have life. Your words build up. Your words tear down. We made a commitment 29 years ago that divorce would never be in our vocabulary. 29 years we've never used that we've had some big fights we've had some big fights she's very intense i'm very intense i'm vo i'm verbal she's working on being more verbal but it can get really intense and she's strong 
And I got to tell you, that, that word has never, strike it out. Just mark it down. You open the door. You give Satan a crack. You say something about divorce, and next thing you know, your marriage is just headed that direction. Live honest and transparent. Keep short accounts of past failures. Walk in forgiveness. Dream of a preferred future. Dream of a preferred future. Always have a bigger goal, a bigger dream, a bigger yes. Whether it's us talking about retirement, whether it's, it's, it's talking about our kids, whether it's us talking about our vacation, whether it's talking about the ministry and the church and the future direction of where we're going. God's put a dream. Dream together. Dream together. There's something powerful about it. I love the psalmist. It's been a life verse for us for the last several years. It seemed like a dream too good to be true. When God returned his people who were held captive, we laughed, we sang, we couldn't believe our good fortune. We were the talk of the nations. God was wonderful to them. God was wonderful to us. We are one happy people. We're happy people today because we said yes to God. We said yes to our spouses. The, the fourth thing is we commit we commit ourselves to communication. Successful marriages learn how to communicate effectively. Of all the things that people posted on Facebook, that, on Facebook that other people might need help with, this is the top topic, communication. James chapter 1 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. My challenge, my challenge personally, is that we are on the same page. So we went to this new restaurant that just opened. Actually, it's an old restaurant that shut down and reopened over here on 46. It's actually called 46. It's a little barbecue joint. And we were there Friday night with, with my son and his friend and, and Laura and I. And, and they brought out you know, a great big pile of meat. And they had these really small sides. They brought out three small, I mean, I mean for three guys, they were like 12 green beans. I mean, we're all working out, we're all hungry. Three green beans, six french fries, and a little thing, tiny thing of beans. Three pounds of meat, but little tiny sides. And so we get home, and, and uh, she's standing by the refrigerator. We moved into this new place right down the street here, got a little townhouse over here, and, and the refrigerator's smaller. And so I'm looking at her, and I'm saying, man, those sides were really small, weren't they? Now, I'm talking about the sides at the restaurant, she thinks that I'm talking about the sides of the refrigerator. <laughs> and that's what happens in your life. You're saying one thing, she's hearing another. That whole communication thing's a big deal. I have one mouth, but sometimes I talk so fast I think I have two mouths. <laughs> but God's given me one mouth and two ears. And if we're going to grow in communication, we've got to learn to become better listeners. Better listeners. How do you know you're struggling in the area of communication? You often find yourself bickering. If you're bickering all the time, you're not communicating well. Does your spouse have a hard time? Like that little conversation that we just, does she have a hard time understanding what you're saying or what, what she's saying? If you do, then it's because uh, uh, you're not communicating well. How well does your spouse feel like, how well does your spouse feel like you communicate? That's a really good question for you to ask your spouse when you leave this place today. Become a good listener. Read the non-verbal cues. It isn't just what's said, but it's, you know, that look across the room, that kick underneath the table, right? Read the communication skills, verbal or non-verbals. Don't say everything you feel. I love Proverbs 29. It says, a fool gives full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. A fool just says, well, I felt it. I got to say it. You don't have to say everything that you're thinking. I heard this story about this lady, and, and, and you know, man, she was just having one of those didn't feel very pretty days. And she's looking in the mirror, and she feels fat, and she sees the wrinkles, and her hair is turning gray, and she's not feeling very good about herself. And she turns to her husband, and, and she says, can you just say something really nice about me? Just, can you say something really nice? And he's looking, and he's, boy, that's a really tough one, you know. He's trying to, trying to he goes, you know. He says, well, you have really good eyesight. <laughs> That's a fool. That guy said the wrong thing. You don't have to say everything you feel. Tell the truth in love. Tell the truth in love. Speak the truth. 
Say what you mean. Control your language. Cursing, screaming, yelling in the home. It just doesn't happen. I've had one regret in my life. About 27 years ago, I lost my temper and I really screamed and I lost complete control and I was cursing and yelling. And to this day, one of my biggest regrets in my marriage is that I did that. I can't forget it. She's probably forgot it. But that, that right there, that will bring death into a relationship quicker than anything. Practice proper timing. Pra practice proper time. Say the right thing at the right time. This is so huge. This is so huge. We, you know, you know they're already upset. You know it's already intense. The wrong times to tell the person that they did wrong is right when the action happened. We almost always know that we did wrong. Right? So proper, find proper timing in your communication with your spouse. And then the final, the last one here, successful marriages continue to grow. Can successful marriages continue to grow. Paul the Apostle said, I pray that your love will keep on growing and that you will fully know and understand how to make right choices. Continue to grow as an individual. Continue to grow as a person. Paul the Apostle mastered this. He modeled it. At the end of the life, right before he died, he told his partner Timothy, he said, Timothy, my disciple, come and bring me the books, especially my papers. At the end of Paul's life, he was facing execution. He's still studying. He's still becoming a better Paul. Continue to grow not only as a person, but as a couple. We have small groups here. And one of the designs of small groups is for you to get connected, not only with other Christians, but you and your spouse, if you're married, you can grow together with other families and community. You can talk with other families. You can pray with other families, other people you can develop relationship with. Our small group uh, met this last Wednesday night, and I was so encouraged. I was so encouraged because I said, every couple in that room has made a decision. Every person has made a decision that they want to grow as a couple together make that choice. We're going to grow together as a couple. Understand what season of life you're in. You know, there's four seasons of life. There's four seasons in the natural, but there's four seasons in your relationship. There's first, there's the spring season. This was, this was, uh, this season right here. I want to show you this picture of my son. He was five years of age and put that picture up of Austin when he was five. Austin was five years of age and he played soccer. Keenan wasn't born yet. Keenan came right after that. And I remember that season of our life, we were running. We were still running, but it was so busy. And the spring season of life is just, you have lots of activities. You got kids and you got a daughter, she's in ballerina, and the son's in soccer, and your work and parties and life and birthdays. And there's a there's the spring summer, and then there's a the summer summer. Summer, summer is the summer season of life. Things are just going pretty well. Your marriage is pretty good. Things are just going pretty good. And that's when we tend to want to ease back. That's when we tend to want to take the other person for granted. And then we enter into the, the fall season. The fall season is the change of life season. My son was married a year ago to Paula Cadavid. Now she's Paula Smith. And God has done a great work in their life. But I realized when they got married last year that things were changing in our world. We had one less child that was living in the home. We have more food in our refrigerator. <laughs> the seasons are changing. You got to know the season. Maybe your season is the winter season. Winters can be cold. Winters can be hard. You got to know what season of life you're in. Because in different seasons, you have different things that you need to work on, different areas that you, that you need to grow in, different priorities that you need to commit to as a family. A good friend of mine used to always say, small refinements to a good thing make it great. You might have a good marriage today, but God wants to make it better. Amen. And see, what I learned, what I've learned over the last 29 years is that this thing is not just about us anymore. This thing isn't just about us. This thing is about my kids. The reason that God hates divorce, Malachi said, is because, because it destroys the family. And it's not even just about my wife and I and our two boys and their spouse or their future spouse. It's about you. You see, because we're in a community today, and the decisions I make not only affect my life, but they'll affect your life. I had two boys. I was, I was Austin and Kenan's dad. And as I've grown older, I realize that I'm not just Austin and Kenan's dad. I have a lot of people around here that see me as a dad. And my commitment today isn't just to us four and no more. So I'm in a different season of life. You're in a different season than you were five years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, Laura mentioned Lou Holtz. It was a great quote. 
The only thing that will be different in your life five years from now are the books you read, the people that you meet, and the dreams that you dream. The dreams that you dream. As a spouse today, as a couple today, God's called you to dream new dreams. New dreams. So what's your part? Everyone say, so what? So what do we do with this? Adjust for the seasons of life. What season you are in right? I mean, get honest. With it. Where, where are you at in your life? Maybe you're at the opposite end. One of the Facebook quotes was about a couple that had just retired and trying to figure out what their purpose is. Maybe you're just starting off first service. There was a couple that had only been married for two months. There was a couple that had only been married for one month. You're in that season of just discovering this process. Adjust to the season of life that you're in. Believe that the best is yet to come. But come on, say, believe that the best is yet to come. So everyone say that with me. Believe that the best is yet to come. And finally, commit to finishing strong. Commit. Everyone say commit. Commit, commit to finishing strong. I want you to close your eyes.